Hey YouTube! Okay, so uh, this is a follow-up video to the video I did before called How Pouch TV Works, and that was a huge video. This one should be a bit shorter, hopefully. Uh, this one is called How Pouch TV Adapters Work, because that was kind of the subject I wanted to get into last time, um, but I didn't because my computer ran out of disk space because I was so long-winded. So hopefully this one, this one won't be nearly so long-winded. So. I want to talk about how adapters work. So just a, a little refresh from what we talked about last time. So in PouchDB, there are no less than four adapters. There's the HTTP adapter. And, oh, sorry, let me zoom in. Um, there's the HTTP adapter, which is the least interesting because it's just a proxy to CouchDB, Cloud, and uh, whatever. Um, IndexedDB, uh, WebSQL in the browser, those two in the browser, and LevelDB in Node. And they're all very, very similar. So they all expose a very similar API. Um, there is an abstract class that they all extend from and that kind of simplifies the implementation a bit, and that's in adapter.js. So this defines an abstract adapter uh, somewhere down here. Yeah, abstract pouch TV. It defines an abstract adapter. It's not a whole lot of code. It mostly just, uh, just kind of does some sugar functions. Like I know there, there's stuff in here to uh, parse some of the user arguments, and to massage the user arguments, uh, to do some of the handling between callbacks and promises so that we can expose a nice API that's both promisey and callbacky, whichever one you prefer. Um, but really the guts of the PouchDB structure, like the, the schema structure, is in these individual adapter implementations. And uh, I'm gonna talk about these three today, uh, IndexedDB, LevelDB, and WebSQL. And I'm going to talk about them at a high level because they're actually all very similar. Like if you look at their code, um, you know, on the on the surface, you may think they're just totally different, right? Like in uh, like in WebSQL, we got a bunch of of SQL expressions going on, right? And then in IndexedDB, we've got a bunch of uh, IDB operations going on, right? Um, but actually, conceptually, they're all very similar, and this is no accident. We did this because really there's only one good way to implement CouchDB, or rather there's there's a few good ways to do it, but they're all very, very similar. And they all kind of stem from the uh, the design of CouchDB itself. So when Dale first wrote the IndexedDB adapter, or when Michael Rogers wrote it, I guess, and then Dale uh, rewrote it pretty heavily, uh, Dale was inspired by the actual Erlang implementation of CouchDB because he was... He'd worked on that code base before. I never have. I don't think I have a single line of code committed to CouchDB, but he had worked on it. And uh, and so CouchDB was more or less a very faithful representation of the Erlang schema in JavaScript. So let's just let's just map this out at a high level. So very quickly, if you look at the uh, web SQL implementation, for instance, and you skip all the migration code, migration code is in order to get uh, PouchDB, uh, a database that was created with an older version of PouchDB, up to speed with the latest version of, of PouchDB, and that's a lot of um, uh, manipulation of tables, adding indexes that didn't exist before, things like that. But if you skip all that and you go to, let's just find uh, some kind of create table statement, right? Um, okay, you can see that there's a bunch of tables here. We've got a meta table, uh, attachments, uh, attachments and revisions, the revision IDs, uh, documents. Uh, a seek store and a local store. And then if you compare this to the IndexedDB implementation, you search for, uh, what is it called, create object store, I think? Yeah, there's actually something very similar. There's almost there's almost a one-to-one -one mapping between these uh, web, these SQLite tables and the IndexedDB object stores. They're, the implementations are very, very similar. And in level DB, it's also very similar. You can see the same kind of language used over and over again by sequence store, doc store. So what is all this stuff? I'm going to map it out at a high level. This is kind of like, I'm just going to do a brain dump of what a sort of, uh, what a sort of abstract uh, or high level PouchDB adapter looks like. So this is how they're implemented. Uh, so you'll recall that um, in CouchDB, we have rev trees, right? So there isn't just one state for a document. There's uh, many revisions for a document, and that's called the rev tree or the revision tree. And basically, the way you can think of it is that if you have, uh, say, three documents, uh, let's do some freeform drawing. Can I draw? So, 
<clears throat> Excuse me. I'm trying to find where the pencil tool is. Okay, so if you have three documents in your database, right, from your point of view, you know, you think you've got three documents, A, B, and C, right? Let's imagine that you gave each of these the ID of A, B, and C. Right? That's what you think is in there. The way that CouchDB and PouchDB sees this is that each one of these actually represents a rev tree. So the way I visualize it is that I imagine every document was its own Git repo. So the way that CouchDB actually sees it is something like this, right? Like it's got a big tree of revisions. Each one of those represents a rev. So each of these little dots right, would be a rev. Right, so this is actually your A, and then this is your B, and then this is your C. Right? Each one of these is just a tree. And then for each one of these, there is some revision that is the current winning revision. And there's a particular way that this is calculated. Um, typically, I mean, for most people, they just have a single lineage, so these trees aren't actually going to look like trees, they're going to look more like, like sticks, um, in which case, it's just going to be the final one that's the winning revision. But otherwise, there's a way to calculate this, and CouchDB does calculate this, so there's some winning revision, right? And this is what you see when you iterate over all docs, is you see the winning revision of A, B, and C. But under the hood, actually, the entire history is kept, uh, which is really great. Like, I, I think that's an amazing thing. You can always go back in time, you can always merge conflicts. Um, I mean, you can, you can implement infinite undo in PouchDB. That's really cool. Infinite undo and redo. You could totally implement that using, using PouchDB because the entire history, revision history is saved. So, but how can we represent this on disk, right? This is really tough, right? This is a tree. This is a very difficult structure to represent on disk. Um, and the way we do it is very simple. So basically we have two stores. We have what we call the by doc store. And we have the by sequence store. And the way you can think of this is that, um, so sequence is kind of like another name for rev, really. They're, they're kind of one and the same. Uh, sequence is if you, say you do info on your database, you'll get something called back called update seek or something like that. It's, it's usually an integer in CouchDB. It may not be an integer depending on the, the backend in cloud and it's not an integer. But these map to the revisions. Um, and it's what CouchDB uses internally in order to make sure that it's actually up to date with uh, a target or source database, right? So it knows that, all right, I'm on sequence 13, but I need to get up to sequence 15, things like that. Um, so at a high level, the way this ends up looking is that the by doc store is, well, let's get uh, my pencil back. So the by doc store is going to be indexed by ID. So uh, document ID. So in that past example, let's say we had uh, those three documents, A, B, and C, right? Your table, let's say, or your object store or whatever, is going to look like this. You've got A, B, and C. So this is by ID, right? ID. And Inside of this, what we actually store as the data is usually just a big JSON blob of that tree. So we actually store it as like a big JSON object uh, containing the entire tree. So this is the index that's used when you call all docs. And that's why all docs is so fast, is because it's using this built-in ID index. And this is why I always advise people to just like, just abuse your doc IDs. You know, I mean, like the thing you do in a normal database, right, is you, your ID is whatever and you don't care, you know, your, your primary key can just be an auto incrementing ID and maybe you never use it, but, and the meat is in some kind of secondary index. In uh, CouchDB and PouchDB, that will kill your performance. You do not want to do that. So if you, um, if you care at all about performance, it's much better to make your ID something fancy that you can use as much as possible for sorting um, because this is, the, this is the index you get for free. Um, so that is that is one of the indexes you get for free. The other one you get for free is, uh, as I described, this by seek store. So this is oh shoot, um, let's go back. Uh, I'm sure, there's a way to move this thing around. Oh well, uh, it doesn't matter. In any case, um, the other one you get for free, in a sense, is this by seek store, and this is indexed based on the document ID and the revision. 
Uh, under the hood, we actually just store it as a concatenation between the two, doc ID, rev. But the really important thing is that the bisect store has auto incrementing IDs. Um, so this thing is indexed by sequence. I mean, like the name would suggest, right? And so what this actually looks like under the hood would be something like this. One, two, three. And this stores the actual document data for each of these things. So, um, so whatever you actually are storing in your document, that's what's going in here. Like on the first table, the by doc store, it's actually just storing metadata. So it's just storing that tree I showed you, but it's just storing the metadata of that tree, right? So it's saying that, you know, revision blah was the parent of revision whatever, and revision foo was the, re was the parent of revision bar, and then it forked off. Like that's what it's storing, just the metadata. In the bike seek store, it's actually your full document that you're storing. Uh, and then also there's uh, an index here on the rev, because as I said, the rev and the seek are basically one and the same. So this is the store that's used when you do changes. So when you call changes on PouchDB, it just marches through the by sequence store. So you tell it, um, you know, give me all the changes since, like there's the since parameter in changes. You say since five or since 10 or whatever. It just goes to this sequence index and just marches through. Um, so this is why like when people, People will often misunderstand uh, how this is set up in terms of like how to get the best performance out. I'll often see people do things like, like they really they'll really tie themselves into knots trying to use filter or views or something like that when they're um, when they're doing changes, and that is really not helpful. And like uh, I mean that's so what the filter does is it says you know go through the changes list but then apply this filter function, and you can also reference a design document. It's, it's super complicated and really easy to mess up. I see people mess it up a lot, and I always tell them, just don't bother. Just use changes and filter it in memory in your own JavaScript code. It's way simpler, and actually, you don't get any performance benefits from using view, filter, any of that stuff. You would in CouchDB, because the reason CouchDB has this feature is that um, you want to send as little data as possible over the wire. In CouchDB, it's all local, so it doesn't matter. Uh, we just re-implemented it because we re-implement everything in CouchDB. Um, so basically the way you should think of it is that these are the two indexes you get for free in PouchDBs. You get an index on the ID and an index on um, on the order that changes were made to the database, which is changes. And that's another thing. Sometimes I see people uh, basically trying to re-implement changes themselves, like creating a secondary index to keep track of the order the documents were inserted into the database. Man, you can just use changes. You know, that's what it's there for. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is that uh, so for a very common operation, which is that you do all docs, right? And you, uh, and you want to get all the documents in the database, maybe within a certain slice. Uh, so maybe from, you know, ID greater than B and less than C or something like that. It actually has to tie these two tables together. So in SQL, this ends up being a join. And in IndexedDB, this ends up being um, the IndexedDB equivalent of a join, which is actually quite a bit slower than the SQL I join. Um, although in IndexedDB 2.0, they have talked about uh, doing a, a kind of bulk get operation, but we don't have that yet. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind is that, because I mean, you know, think about it. If you need to fetch uh, documents from this ID to that ID, and you need the latest version of each one, right, the winning revision, then you have to tie these two tables together. So the way we do that is we go, uh, we go through this, this by doc store, we grab each piece of metadata by that ID, and then we tie that, we join that. So say like say A corresponds to this one, and maybe C corresponds to that one, and B corresponds to this one, because maybe A was inserted first, and then C was inserted uh, second, and then B was inserted third. And the rev will be something like A underscore blah, like that big, ugly string that is the rev. Um, and so we, we can get that rev value from the metadata, this thing right here, this metadata, right? That tells us what the winning revision is, and then we tie it together with the second store. So that's how all docs uh, is delivered to you. Um, yeah, and then when we do changes as well, there's a reason that we also have to tie the two tables together. Can't quite remember why. Uh, there's there's some reason we need the metadata. I guess again to find the winning revision. Um, if you do include docs equals true when you do changes, things like that. And this this matters for replication as well because recall that the replication algorithm uses changes. Um, when, when it, it fetches all the changes from the remote database. Um, so yeah, at a high level, that's how adapters work. 
And so you can see this play out in the code. So let's just uh, let's just go through the code a little bit and, and watch how this works. So for instance, uh, here's an IndexedDB store right here. So here's how the thing is created. Uh, there's a doc store with a key path of ID, and that's just the document ID. And then there's a by sequence store, which is auto increment true, right? Because we want that auto incrementing um, seek number, the one, two, three, four, so we know what order changes are made to the database. Um, and then, whereas in Web SQL, so this, these are object stores in IndexedDB, whereas in Web SQL, instead we've got a table uh, called blah, 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 doc. Create table if not exists, doc store, and this is just the string uh, doc store. So it's got a unique ID, right, ID, and then a bunch of JSON, uh, what the winning seek is. Um, and that's tied to the by seek store, which again has sequence, which is an, uh, uh, an auto incrementing integer, right, the one, two, three, four, and then JSON. So uh, in this case, on the doc store, recall, the JSON would be the metadata, so the tree describing what changes were made where. And then on the seek store, the JSON would be the document itself. And then let's see uh, how this looks in level DB, because again, it's very similar. Um, oh man, it's been a while since I looked at level DB. I don't remember exactly what to look for. We use sublevel, which is a, a really neat library. I forget who wrote it exactly. But what it basically does is it allows you to use a single level DB store and to have many substores inside of that. And what's nice about that is that you get a lot of guarantees about consistency. So for instance, we can when we do bulk docs in um, in WebSQL and, and IndexedDB, we do, when we do bulk docs and we insert, say, 100 documents at once, IndexedDB and WebSQL give us a guarantee that we have a transaction. So we, we get a transaction handle, we shove those 100 docs in. If anything fails at, at any point, for whatever reason, user closes their browser, whatever, the database is not affected. It's as if you know those none of those docs have been put in. Uh, LevelDB can give us those same guarantees across these substores, but not across multiple stores. So, um, so we take advantage of this by using these sub sub levels, sub stores, so that when we do a bulk docs operation, even though this is not normally a thing that level DB would, would guarantee us, we actually can offer the same consistency that index DB and uh, and Web SQL give us. I, I wrote this, I wrote this little little piece of code called level DB transaction, which just is kind of some sugar, so that I could kind of write code that looks a little bit like index DB, but not quite. And, um, and this, this handles all that. So that's really nice. Anyway, um, so if we look at these substores, so we've got all these sublevels, um, and here there's one called doc store, right? Um, and this is just, uh, it's JSON encoded, and uh, uh, level DB doesn't have secondary indexes, so all of these are just, um, are just on basically a key to a value. Um, so in this case, the key would be the doc ID, and the value would be just a big blob of JSON. Now the by sequence store is very similar. Um, this one, the key is going to be the integer. So it's, uh, yeah, and, and actually, interestingly, because LevelDB only uses string keys, or rather, like, lexicographically ordered keys or whatever, our sequence number ends up being, like, 0000000001 or something like that, and then 0000002. But, um, yeah, so level DB is kind of the odd, the odd duck out. It kind of it, look, kind of looks weird compared to the other ones, mostly because of this lack of secondary indexes. But for the most part, uh, it's very very similar. Um, so I talked about how documents are stored. I want to talk a little bit about attachments because that's where it gets kind of fancy. Um, oh, first I should mention um, real quickly. Each of these also has a local store, which is an optimization that we made. Um, so there's this local store here. Uh, there is in Web SQL as well. Right, uh, yeah, local store, and also in IndexedDB, there's a local store. And all that is, is that's just holding the local documents. So if you go to the, the PouchDB guide, there's an explanation of local documents. This, this is like a kind of a not super well-known uh, feature of, uh, of CouchDB and PouchDB, but basically they're documents that don't replicate and, um, and they don't have a revision tree. They just they only store the latest revision, so they're actually really good for performance in some cases. If you really like, if you're writing a plugin or something, and you really want to optimize for for great performance, you can uh, use these. And you know you're not replicating. You can use these local docs because they're just stored in one table. So there isn't like this tying together of the two different tables when we iterate through the local docs. And uh, in practice, if you're not using any plugins, local docs are uh, used by replication 
in order to store checkpoints. So when you replicate from one database to another, there's a, also a local doc that gets inserted that says, okay, I replicated from this guy and from this source database. And when I last replicated, I was at sequence 10 or sequence 15, sequence 20, whatever. And then the next time it can ask for changes since 15 or since 20. Um, local documents are also used by the MapReduce plugin and I think uh, by compaction as well. But um, anyway, so there's that local store. But let's talk about attachments. That's that's kind of an interesting structure as well. So if you look at this this setup right here, you see that the actual documents, like what what users actually perceive as documents, is actually stored in this by sequence store, right? Because we actually store the full data for every revision. So if you modify, it, this is maybe not the best design, but I think it works out performance wise. If you have a huge document, right, and you modify just one tiny tiny field on, it, or you don't modify anything at all, you just like put it like you just call db.put or whatever, then we take that entire blob and it's duplicated. It's totally duplicated on disk, right? We'll just keep inserting it into the by sequence store. And, and you can get like really pathological use cases of PouchDB if you do this wrong. Like, um, like a, a, a bad way to use PouchDB, for instance, would be to say, uh, modify a document for every keystroke that a user enters. Like say they're writing, say they're composing an email or something and you're saving emails and you insert a new document for every character that they type, well, that's going to be horrible because it's it's just going to be copying each one. Um, and this is a design decision uh, that we also borrowed from CouchDB. Uh, one of the benefits is that it makes writes really fast, right? Because we uh, we're not storing like diffs or something complicated like that. Um, we're just shoving it off to just flushing it to disk every time we want to write something. Um, but anyway, so what you perceive or what users perceive as actual documents are in this by sequence store. So when it comes to attachments, right? Um, attachments are associated with each of these revisions because recall that um, when you store a revision to uh, a document you might remove some attachments or add some attachments or something like that um, a document can have many attachments and an attachment can have many documents and under the hood we optimize by calculating the, uh, the checksum for each attachment so that ensures that if you save the same attachment in multiple documents or in multiple revisions of the same document that actually only writes to disk once. So that's actually a case where if you did if you did do things the naive way and you attach some gigantic attachment to your document and just kept updating it over and over again, actually it's not going to take up a whole lot of space on disk because we only store one version of that. So this is what it ends up looking like. Um, basically at a high level, you're going to have your by sequence store, uh, right? So this is the thing. I mentioned before, by seek. Right, you're gonna have this thing. Um, then you're gonna have uh, an attached store. We have a few different names for this in the different adapters. I think in level D it might be called binary store or something like that. But this is what holds the attachments themselves. So let's call this attached store. Or just attach for short. Okay, so the by sequence store I mentioned before, the attached store, its structure is, is pretty simple. What this looks like is it's gonna be straight up key value. Each of the keys is going to be a digest, so an MD5 sum of that attachment. And that maps to the blob. There's a blob. <laughs> Sort of, kind of looks like a blob. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is a table that maps MD5 sums to their blobs. So when you insert um, an image, MP3 file, whatever binary data, we compute a checksum. We use this library called Spark MD5 for that, which uh, claims to be the fastest. They've got some numbers to back it up, and it also has a nice way of doing things incrementally, which is nice. So that if you have a huge, huge uh, attachment, then we don't try to compute the MD5 sum all at once, which could block the DOM. We do it in little bitty chunks so that uh, it doesn't block the DOM too badly. And um, and this would be this would probably be the one case where it would make a lot of sense to do PouchDB operations in a web worker if you can, because um, that way you're just not blocking the DOM at all. But this really only applies to people that are making heavy use of attachments. So, but that that's something good to know. Anyway, so we got this attached store, and we got the by sequence store, which you will recall is like one, two, three, 
four, right? The sequence number or the re revision number or whatever, and then just a JSON blob. But here's where it gets funky, right? Because one document can have many attachments, or one attachment can have many documents. So we solve this the way that uh, you would learn to solve it in your database 101 class, which is with a many-to-many -many table, right? And so we also tend to have a table that's uh, usually called attach seek or something like that, I think, or seek attach. And this is exactly what you would imagine it'd be. It's not, uh, it's nothing groundbreaking, All right? This is just one, two, three, the seek, and then the MD5 sums. Now, why do we need to do this? Um, this was actually something that was solved somewhat recently. I think I, I wrote the code for this, like, uh, no, the, the video is quite far behind. So just hear me talk while you see the table getting, getting drawn. Um, this was something that I wrote, I think about four or five months ago, and uh, we didn't previously have this table mapping between sequences and attachments. The reason that this ended up being necessary was for compaction. So if you are compacting a, t uh, a database that has attachments, um, you know, you, you may be very grateful that PouchDB is doing this thing where it uniquifies based on MD5 sum, right? But that makes it really complicated when you want to compact, right? Because we have to check to make sure that you know, say we delete, um, say we delete, uh, delete revision two, and it maps. Yeah, say we, say we've got. Uh, let's see, let's draw this out. So let's say we delete revision two, and it maps to this attachment, right? It's got a, a handle on this attachment. Um, we can delete all those, but we don't know whether we should delete the attachment or not, right? Um, because it might also be linked to another. Uh, document. So maybe another document also has that same attachment for some reason, right? So it's not orphaned. Whereas uh, with, say, this one right here, let's say this uh, three only has one attachment and it's the only one that has a uh, link to that, then when we scrub out, uh, when we compact th and get rid of this revision, we want to get rid of all these things, right? Because it's been orphaned. But when we scrub out two, we don't want to get rid of this attachment because one still needs it, right? So this is the basic idea of why we maintain this table. And if you look at the compaction code and the auto compaction code, you'll see that it does a check for orphaned attachments, right? So that when it deletes these revisions, it knows whether or not it should delete the attachments. Now this becomes really, really useful when you have a database where you're storing lots of binary data and you're also compacting it quite a bit. So, and, uh, uh, be and this is especially important because binary attachments tend to take up so much space, right? So this is exactly the thing that you want most to compact. And so I, I thought it was an important feature. Um, so we got that implemented, I think like four or five months ago or something. Um, but this is how that, this is how that, uh, that table is structured. Those tables are structured. So we look at the actual code to see what that looks like. Uh, let's start again with web SQL. I think web SQL is the easiest to understand. That's, that's just me. Some people disagree. Um, so you'll see that there's a table called attach, right? Just as I described. And it's uh, a mapping from a digest, MD5 sum, to a blob, to binary blob, right? Um, I think escaped is a special web SQL thing um, for backwards compatibility, yes. Um, and then attach and rev, there we go, this is exactly what I described before. This is the many-to-many -many table. So this is just a straight up, this uh, two column table, right? We got a mapping of digests to seeks. And this maps back to the by seek store. So yeah, it is, it is exactly as I drew. Um, and then indexdb is also super similar. Uh, so if we look here, we've got, yes, we've got an attached store where again, the, the key path, the key is the digest, the MD5 sum, and that just stores blobs. And then we've got the attach and seek store, which is just a mapping between, um, between uh, digests and seeks. And uh, oh, this, was, this is a funky thing about, um, about index DB, uh, I believe this digest seek is actually a concatenation between the digest underscore sequence. And the reason we do that, no, the reason we do that, I remember now, is because, so IE doesn't support complex keys. So whenever we want to look up something by two fields, like we want to say, you know, get from this, select from this database where foo is this and bar is that, 
right? We have two things we want to query on. We have to actually just kind of slam them together and create a new key out of that. So that's what we do here. Um, so that, that way when we want to, like if, if foo is one and bar is two, then we search for one underscore two. And this is just a hack we have to use for index DB because of IE. Um, but it's, it's, it's not too bad. It is, this doesn't make me cry too much when I see this code, just, just a little bit. Um, I don't remember why we had to do auto increment true though. I feel like that's adding a third, a third index that isn't necessary, but I'm, I'm sure there was, there was a reason for this. Um, yeah, I cannot, I cannot tell you why, but if you look in the code, I'm sure that you'll see there's some kind of place where we're deleting by primary key or something. And this primary key is a third thing separate from the seek and the digest seek. Um, index DB has, has some, some little quirks that you have to learn and, uh, I wrote this code and I do not remember why we had to do that, but I'm sure if I actually read the code, I would see that. Anyway, so let's talk about level DB. Level DB also looks similar. Um, uh, level DB is actually a, a bit more complicated than the other ones, as you can imagine, because we lack this actual secondary index, right? Uh, the way we do it in level DB is we have a binary store, which this is uh, just key is digest and the value is just binary blob. Um, and then the attachment store, okay, is uh, a store that only contains it also contains the digest, yeah, it contains the digest, and then it contains, uh, it contains JSON describing the attachment. So basically, uh, yeah, that's right. It describes like some metadata about the attachment, like what, what's the size, what's the MD5 sum, um, what's, the, uh, what's the encoding, what's the MIME type, things like that. Because, uh, so when you query the database and you ask for all documents, but you don't say attachments true, then you just get metadata about the attachments, right? You just get like the size and the MIME type and things like that. So when the user queries that, we're very careful that we don't want to actually pull out the entire binary data, right? You just want the fastest possible thing. You just want that metadata really fast. You don't want to, have to wait around to pull out the binary data. So we made sure to do that here. And we also do it in the other adapters as well. Um, and the only place, yeah, and the only place where it gets a little funky is that you notice we don't have this many-to-many -many store. And that's because there, you, there really is no concept of a many-to-many -many store in level DB because there's no secondary index, right? So I believe this um, this attachment store, let's actually see how this how this is handled. So I search for usages of this attachment store. I can jog my memory about how exactly this is stored. Right, the key is the digest, yeah. The value is the attachment. What is this? Okay, yes, that's right. So, right, so inside of this uh, kind of metadata about the attachment store, we store this thing called refs. And refs is a mapping of, um, right, is a mapping of IDs and revs that, uh, that refer to this, um, they refer to this uh, attachment. So any, any revisions, any document revisions that have a reference to this, um, to this attachment are just stored in a big JSON blob. And um, this is this was the fastest thing we could think of to do for level DB, and um, yeah, I think it, it makes sense. But it's it's definitely the most it's it's definitely the weirdest out of all of them. Like the um, the other two don't have this concept. They have kind of a more classic database schema, right? This uh, many to many table. Um, the only other thing that you'll notice in kind of these schemas is that there's al is almost always some kind of meta store or something, or like index DB has this detect blob support store where we just store whether or not we were able to store a blob because index db has all these problems with different adapters not supporting binary blobs or sometimes some of them support binary blobs but some versions of chrome don't things like that um, this meta store usually just contains information like um it's kind of auto generated id for the database or i think in web sql we do we still store the encoding i don't think we store the encoding anymore but we used to um Right, a database version because we handle migrations manually in in Web SQL. And level DB, the meta store stores what exactly? I don't remember. Alright, the update sequence for the entire database. Uh, the doc count for the entire database. So that's an interesting thing about level DB as well, is that uh, level DB has no way to just say, you know, count all the things in this database. There's no count by. Like in SQL, you'd have a count, uh, you know, select count of star, blah, blah, blah. Um, and even IndexedDB has a, a dot count function. But there's no such thing in level DB. But actually, this isn't so bad because um, under the hood, I do know that SQLite does not index that count. And so that actually, so we have some, some smart caching that we do in 
Web SQL and IndexedDB to avoid calling count as much as we can. In LevelDB, we actually get it for free just because um, we update the count ourselves and we make sure that it stays in sync with the underlying data store. So at some point, we're going to just copy this LevelDB code over to the other ones. Um, so it, it's really been an interesting experience because each of these, there's kind of, each of these adapters kind of stemmed from the same source. Like Dale did his implementation of IndexedDB, which is based on CouchDB. And then they kind of splintered off into Web SQL and LevelDB. And nowadays, it's almost like looking at the Romance languages, right? It's like, it's like this one's kind of like Portuguese, and then you know, Web SQL's like Spanish, and then another one's like Italian or something. And you can kind of see the similarities between the between the different versions. But then some of them have little innovations that the other ones don't have. And uh, it's it's been really really fun because sometimes there's been like an innovation that we had in one adapter, and then we realized, oh, that was a really good idea. We should do that for the other adapters too. And then we did. Like Calvin implemented the uh, local store. I think he implemented it first for level DB, um, just because it really simplified things. It used to be that we stored the local documents with the regular documents, but then we needed we needed uh, a, a secondary index to check whether it was local or not, so we could skip the local ones when they did all docs, and it got really complicated. And for level DB, it was really complicated because they didn't have um, they didn't have uh, secondary indexes, and so. The previous code was just scanning through the entire database, which was super inconvenient, super inefficient. So Calvin looked at that and was like, okay, why don't we just put the local documents in a different store? And then he did that, and I was like, oh, okay, that's actually a really good idea. Let's do that for Web SQL and IndexedDB as well. And then we did. So um, yeah, like each each adapter has given has, has offered something to the other adapters to learn. And um, and today they kind of uh, they all kind of uh, mirror each other, but uh, but they're not exactly the same. But, uh, but they're very fun to work with. I, I, I enjoy this adapter code a lot. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little presentation about how PouchDB adapters work. And I hope that you are inspired to contribute to PouchDB or just check out the code and, um, you know, just look at it if it's fun to read. Maybe write your own adapter. Um, so thanks for watching.